Okay, so we're going to hold the attention and intrigue the intellect. He opened the dingy green door, hearing as he did so the clang of a bell that gave warning of his presence, and entered the shop, his discovery in his hand. The shop was in darkness, save for such light, from the street lamp as made its way between the volumes rang, ranged in ranks in the window. The characteristic smell of ancient books was heavy on the air, but through that smell came faint wafts of another smell, aromatic, pungent, sweet. It was not incense, at least it was not church incense. It was not joss sticks or pastilles. It, can say, it contained something of all three, and something else beside, which he could not place. It was very faint, as if the draft of the opening door had dis disturbed vague wafts of it where they lay hidden in crevices among the books. Coming as it did immediately upon his reading of the black mass and its stinking incense, and coming in darkness, it affected him to a degree that startled him, and he felt with A.E.W. Mason's hero, as if the shell of the world might crack and some streak of light come through. For a moment, the obsession of the recent happenings was broken. The memory of them was gone from him, as if a wet sponge had been passed across a slate, and his mind was suddenly made new. Receptive, quivering, in anticipation of what was about to be given him. He heard someone stirring in an inner room, and the sound of a match being struck. Evidently, the bookshop did not run to electric light. Then a dim, warm radiance shone across the floor in a broad streak, coming from under a curtain slung across a doorless gap between the books, and in another moment he saw the figure of a tall, stooping man in a dressing gown, or some such volume voluminous garment thrusting aside the curtain and coming through into the front shop. The curtain fell back into place again, and everything was once more in darkness. Pardon me, said a voice. I will strike a light. I was not expecting that anyone would call this wet evening. The match scraped and then flared. He had a momentarily glimpse of a vulturin head, bald, with a fringe of grizzled red hair. A great eagle's beak seemed on its way to make junction with the prominent Adam's apple, and the stringy neck left bare by a low and crumpled soft collar and a big jaguar camel's hair dressing gown enveloped all the rest. Damn, said a voice as the match went out. That single word told Paston that he had to do with a man of education, a gentleman, a man not too remotely removed from his own world. Not thus do the... Proletariat, the proletariat, proletariat, who are the proletariat? Not thus do the proletariat swear when they burn their fingers. Another match flared up, and carefully shielding it with his large bony hands. The individual in the dressing gown reached up to his full height and lit an incandescent gasolier hanging from the ceiling in the center of the room. Only a very tall man could have done it, 
and was the proprietor of the bookshop, if that were what he was. He revealed himself as a great gaunt framework of a man whose loose clothes hanging slackly upon him. His ungirt dressing gown with its trailing cords making him look like a huge bat hung by its hooked wings and sleep. The past. Paston saw much in that single glimpse, even as he had heard much in that single word. The ancient and nondescript garments were not cheap, reach me down, but honest Harris Tweed. As the light flared up and his eyes took in the books ranged all around him, he saw at once that the two penny bin was no criterion of the contents of the shop, but was filled with unregarded throwouts, and that the bookseller was a specialist and a scholar. Hugh held out towards him the grubby blue volume in his hand. I got this out of your two-penny bin, he said. Look still, I peered at it. Now how did you get into the two-penny bin, he demanded, as if inquiring of the book itself. It is more than two pence, asked Hugh Paston inwardly amused and wondering whether he would be called upon to wrangle over odd coppers before the book was his. No, no, certainly not, said the bookseller. If it was in the two-penny bin, I'll charge you two pence for it. But I wouldn't have exposed it to that indignity willingly. I have a regard for books. He looked up suddenly and transfixed his interlocutor with a piercing glance. I have a feeling for them that some people have for horses. Are they whittles and drinks to you? said Paston, smiling. They are that, said the bookseller. Shall I wrap it for you? No thanks. I'll take it as it is. By the way, have you got anything else in the same line? It was as if an iron shutter shut as he might pull down outside his shop came down over the bookseller's face. You mean something else by A.E.W. Mason? No, I mean something else about the, uh, Black Mass. The bookseller eyed him suspiciously, not to be drawn. I have got Hossman's La Basse in French. I can't be bothered to read French at the moment. I want something light. Have you got a translation of it? There is no translation, nor will ever be. Why ever not? The British public wouldn't stand for it. Is it as French as all that? No. I'm afraid you're beyond me. Have you got anything else in English along the same lines? There is nothing written. Nothing written that you know of, I suppose you mean? There is nothing written. Oh, well, I suppose you know. Here's your two pence. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Paston found himself outside in the dark. A light rain falling. He had no intention of going back to his own house that night, and as the light rain promised to be the forerunner of... A series of squalls, he cast about in his mind for the nearest hotel that would suit his mood of the moment. For on leaving the bookshop behind, his previous mood had returned. Memories had risen again, like ghosts in the gathering dusk, and he wished urgently to get back among bright lights and other people. 
but not his friends. The last thing he wanted was his friends. He did not want people to talk to him. He just wanted to see the moving about him in bright light. There did not seem much hope of a taxi in that down at Hill district, but it was apparently a shortcut to a good many places, and at that moment, a taxi turned into it, passed in signal, and it drew in to the curb. He gave the driver the address of one of the big, the big railway hotels and got in. The cab swung around and bore him away into the width and straightness and brightness of a main road, and he heaved a sigh of relief. Presently, they arrived at the huge facade of the designated hotel, and he went into the lounge and ordered a whiskey and soda, and lighting a cigarette, settled down to his book. The whiskey and soda had soothed him temporarily, and his nerves were less on edge for the moment. He read rapidly following the twists and turns of detectives and corpses with impatience. He was not reading for the story. He was reading for the information. Information about the opal and its prisoner. Information about the black mass that had so caught his fancy and intrigued him. He gathered from the hasty perusal that the Black Mass was a somewhat messy affair, that a renegade priest was necessary for its performance, also a lady of at least easy manners. He did not discover exactly what was done, nor for what purpose people went to all this trouble. The ceremony in itself did not particularly interest him. Not being a believer, he was not especially scandalized. It was no more to him than a, a parishion music hall. The psychology of it escaped him. The thing in which he was really interested, the thing for which he had bought the book, was his title. The Prisoner in the Opal. The hint of escape, a glimpse of fire from the heart of the stone. The gates of life ajar. For he had come to his journey's end before the number of his days was fulfilled. Life had proved a blind alley, and unless a door opened before him, there was nothing to do but fall over the precipice that is at the world's end. The symbolism of the fire flashing from the heart of the stone with its luminous opacity had fascinated him, but it, it was not elucidated in the course of the book, so far as he could see. The writer had a glimpse, but had lost sight of it again. The idea of the Black Mass had intrigued him, but he had not followed up the trail. Now he, Hugh Paston, given that trail, would have pursued it. And the idea occurred to him. Why shouldn't he pursue it? He had nothing else to lose. No one to consider. If he threw his life away, that was his lookout. As for, as for his soul, he knew nothing about it and cared less. Fortune had returned to him his hostages, and he was a free man. He was intrigued by the idea of following up the clue that the author of The Prisoner in the Opal had dangled for an instant before the eyes of his readers, and then snatched away again. He remembered the words of the second-hand bookseller, that there were no other books on the Black Mass in English, but one in French. Very French French, Hugh Paston had gathered. He glanced at his watch. It was shortly after nine. 
when I go around and if there were a light showing in the shop, knock the fellow up, stand him a drink, and try and get him to talk. He had more than a suspicion the man knew something about the subject of black masses. Else why had he first spoken upon them with authority? And then shut up like a clam. Hugh Paston got his coat. Sinned against the tailor by pushing the bulky novel into a pocket. Left the hotel. That's chapter one.